we need to absolutely close down that loophole that is evading background checks uh, because that is clearly within the authority of the president to do. Um, the second piece is much better uh, assurances that prohibited buyers um, are not able to move forward. So, for example, uh, when someone who is prohibited from buying uh, is actually subject to a background check and fails, we need to make sure that state, lo state and local law enforcement is, uh, is informed so that they can start prosecuting those people for violating the law by trying to buy a gun when they're on the prohibited lists. Um, and then the last uh, piece in the letter is that, you know, our laws recognize that when someone is um, a, a domestic abuser, um, they shouldn't be able to get a gun. And, you know, it's right. just, all of this is very commonsensical, but the law has not been uh, adequately um, clarified to ensure that even when someone's not in a marital relationship, they can be barred. Because, you know, married or not married, if you're a domestic abuser, you're a domestic abuser. Right, that if you want to hurt your, um, your, your significant other, it doesn't really matter whether you're married or not. You shouldn't be able to get a gun. So those are three very, very basic um, things that the president could do uh, working with the FBI and the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms to move forward to make sure those prohibited people are not getting the guns, make sure that those licensed, that gun dealers are actually doing the background checks that they need to and ensuring that people who are domestic abusers can't get a hold of a gun. Caroline, I know this letter got to the president before his speech Sunday night, but I do want to ask you your opinion. Uh, let me just play a short clip first. Mm -hmm. To begin with, Congress should act to make sure no one on a no-fly list is able to buy a gun. What could possibly be the argument for allowing a terrorist suspect to buy a semi-automatic weapon? This is a matter of national security. We also need to make it harder for people to buy powerful assault weapons, like the ones that were used in San Bernardino. I know there are some who reject any gun safety measures. But the fact is that our intelligence and law enforcement agencies, no matter how effective they are, cannot identify every would-be mass shooter, whether that individual is motivated by ISIL or some other hateful ideology. What we can do, and must do, is make it harder for them to kill. President Obama goes on to uh, give his steps that Congress should take, and I want you to explain to the viewers because what seems to confuse people is that the president has executive authority to he doesn't need congress so why is he asking congress to take these steps well so there are different there are laws on the books and there's some that you know the president is calling for um, passage so when the laws the laws that are already on the books he and it's his job under the Constitution. The, the executive branch's job is to faithfully execute the laws. So that is that is our the way our our government is structured. Congress has already passed these laws dealing with licensing and background checks for gun dealers, dealing with uh, prohibited persons, uh, and dealing with domestic abuse. And so those are laws that are already on the books that, that the president can now use his authority to uh, clarify the law and ensure that there's guidance for law enforcement in carrying out those, uh, those, those mandates that Congress has already put into place. But then there are additional steps that the president is now calling on Congress to do. So adding categories to the prohibited persons. So that would be the no-fly list, the terrorist watch list. Um, and what the president is saying is, it certainly seems commonsensical that since we already bar felons and other dangerous people from buying guns, why wouldn't we bar someone right. we think is a terrorist from buying a gun? It's certainly consistent with the understanding or with, with that law that Congress has already passed. Now, a lot of people are criticizing his speech, saying it was just a stay the course speech. What is your opinion on his speech? Well, you know, the, the, the speech itself, um, you know, in terms of, of, of gun policy, um, laid out some very important steps. And one of the things, you know, I wanted to just mention to the viewers was, you know, just yesterday the Supreme Court rejected a, uh, a challenge to a local uh, gun uh, safety uh, regulation from Highland Park, Illinois, where they had, right after Sandy Hook, you know, overwhelmed with this fright that, you know, so many people have when for their children, for their loved ones, when all of those children got mown down and, and it was just a, such a terrible situation. Well, they passed uh, an assault weapons ban 
And, uh, you know, the saying that these high capacity, dangerous, dangerous weapons um, shouldn't be easily accessible. And they passed, passed a ban. And that was challenged. And the Supreme Court turned that away uh, yesterday, basically recognizing that the Supreme Court is probably having some second thoughts about whether it went too far, even even under the construct of Heller, which did recognize that you can have gun regulation, um, but that maybe that even went too far, and that they don't want to get into the business again of sort of of of, of restricting the ability of states and localities um, from adopting very common sensible commonsensical rules about who can have access to guns, making sure dangerous people can't, and making sure that the most dangerous weapons that are not for protection of the home or for hunting, but are actually for highly aggressive acts, that those aren't available. Right. Well, Caroline, thank you so much for pointing that out and for your invaluable insight today.